I'm Christy Baglow, the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. I'm so glad you could join us for this session. I feel like supported decision making is something I'm hearing a lot about. It's a hot topic, so I'm really grateful to Viviana for being here today to teach us all about this new tool in our toolbox. So she will be speaking about supported decision making and alternative to guardianship. And Viviana is uh, Viviana Bonilla Lopez is an Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by the Florida Bar Foundation at Disability Rights Florida. She currently leads Disability Rights Florida's pilot program in Miami-Dade County, where she provides free legal services to people with disabilities, hoping to avoid or terminate a guardianship using supported decision making. So thank you so much for being here, Viviana. I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to be here with all of you because supported decision making is a tool that is also wonderful for older adults. And so when we talk about people with disabilities, that includes age-related disabilities and also just people who might want some additional support. So we'll start off off by watching a video on supported decision making to give you guys the basics of what it is. We all make tons of decisions every day. Some of them are small decisions, like whether or not you should buy that cool new video game or order pizza. Others are bigger, like deciding what kind of career you want, where you want to live, or who to vote for in an election. Everyone has the right to make decisions. Sometimes we need help with those decisions. If you're a young person or an older adult with a disability, your family, medical service provider, or someone else may ask a judge if they can become your guardian and make all of your decisions for you. This is a legal arrangement called full guardianship. Your parent or guardian might think they have to get guardianship to do things like attend IEP meetings or help you make financial decisions, but that's not true. There are other ways that people can help you make choices. For example, a healthcare proxy only helps make healthcare choices, and a social security representative payee only helps with some financial choices. But another option that lets you keep control of your choices is called supported decision making. A supported decision making agreement lays out a plan for you to meet with a person or group of people you trust. These people can be family members, friends, co-workers, or others who can help you make decisions. You pick the decisions you might need help with, who can help, and how. Your group of supporters might look through information with you and talk through the pros and cons of different choices. They might talk with you about eating healthy foods or ways to keep track of appointments. Want to choose a college, vote in elections, or change jobs? What about date, get married, or start a family? With supported decision-making, you are the decision-maker. With guardianship, the guardian is the decision-maker and makes all the final decisions. Some decisions are big, some are small, and all of them are important. Making your own choices can help you lead a happier, healthier life. If you are a person with a disability and feel like you need help making decisions, know that you have options. You have the right to decide. For more information on supported decision making in contact. So this, oh, we all so make this tons. This is a good way to start us off. Gives you a good idea of what supported decision making is. And first and foremost, it's an alternative to guardianship. So it's a way that you can get advice and support from people that you trust without losing the right to make your own decisions. And you know that older adults as they age may start to need more help and support with things that they were doing completely on their own before, but they're still able to do it themselves. And so supported decision-making can be a way for them to start to incorporate that help that they need, but stay in control of their lives and maintain that independence. So we've talked about how this is an alternative to guardianship. What exactly is guardianship? So guardianship is a legal process where if the courts determine that a person does not have capacity, their rights are removed and given to someone else to exercise for them. That person is called the guardian. And then the person under guardianship is called the ward under Florida law, although we don't love that term, so we just call them person under guardianship. 
And it's a process that can be pretty restrictive. So these are all of the rights that you can lose under a guardianship in Florida if the courts find that you don't have capacity. And again, this analysis is supposed to be right by right. So the court is supposed to consider your ability to exercise these rights individually. So the first is the right to get married, the right to vote, the right to personally apply for government benefits, the right to have a driver's license, to travel, work, contract, sue and defend lawsuits, decide where to live, manage property, and decide who your friends are and who you spend time with. So just take a moment, pause, and look at all of these rights. It's a lot, right? And if you think about it, how we choose to exercise these rights every day is what makes us who we are. These are really important choices that can determine the course of our lives. So taking this away from someone is a really big deal and we don't wanna do it unless it's absolutely necessary, unless nothing else is going to work. So think about um, you wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, you get in your car, you drive to work, maybe you stop for gas on the way there, you spend the day at work, then you drive back home to your apartment, unwind, maybe spend some time with a friend or with your spouse. Look at all the rights that you use that one day, right to marry, right to have a driver's license, to travel so you could get to work, to work, to contract, right? So you could have that apartment for the lease, to decide where you live so you could decide that you wanted to live there, to manage your property so you could buy some gas on the way to work and to decide who your friends are. All of that in just one day. So you can see that the impact of losing these rights is a big deal. So what are alternatives that we should try before? <laughs> Guardian advocacy is something I do want to touch upon briefly. Um, guardian advocacy is similar to guardianship. I think the big difference between them is who it's for and how you get into it. So these are specifically for people with developmental disabilities. I won't go into them specifically because, I mean, it could be for an older adult who has a developmental disability, but it might not be applicable to everyone. I would say the big difference here is in the due process protections that are afforded to the person who would be under the guardianship or guardian advocacy, there are less due process protections in guardian advocacy. And due process protection is sort of lawyers speak for, you know, when we're going to take something away from you, we have to make sure that you have an opportunity to be heard and that we're very careful about doing that. So that's what due process is, is making sure that the government, before they take something away from you, has given you all the opportunities to defend yourself. So with guardianship, there are three experts who are appointed to decide, does the person have capacity? With guardian advocacy, the question isn't about capacity. The question is, do you have a developmental disability that makes it so you can't make your own decisions? And then um, the process there can be based just on the papers. There doesn't have to be an expert to evaluate you. For younger people, it can just be based on an IEP. And then um, you have a right to an attorney in both instances, so that's really important. They're just different in terms of who they're for and, and what the outcome is. Also important with guardian advocacy, the person needs to maintain at least one right. And so I've seen some guardian advocacies that are uh, pretty restrictive where they'll lose all of their rights except the right to vote. So they're almost under a plenary guardianship. So in practice, they can be very, very similar, but they're set up for different people. And with guardian advocacy, the disability has to have manifested before the age of 18. So it, you know, it might not be applicable to all older adults. So before I turn to frequently asked questions, which is how I've structured this presentation, does anyone have questions on guardianship or guardian advocacy? I don't see any questions yet, Viviana. Okay, perfect. So we will keep going. So the first question, my 80-year-old mother is starting to have difficulty managing her affairs. What tools are available for me to assist her? So there are many ways outside of a guardianship to offer support. And we saw that in the video. So what are those ways, right? The first is supported decision-making. That's obviously our favorite. And that's the process where you can rely on people who you trust to give you advice and help and assistance with doing the things that you want to do and with making your own decisions. So for example, um, my mother's aunt is currently 
living in an assisted living facility and she has trouble getting to the bank. So she signed a power of attorney authorizing my mom to make deposits and take money out of the bank account for her, right? So that's one example where my mom is acting as my aunt supporter, right? She's helping her give her advice on what she should be doing with her money, how to spend it. Is that too expensive? Is that a good idea? And then she's also actually able to act on her behalf. The only way, or one of the ways I should say, to have someone act on your behalf is to sign a power of attorney. And I like to tell my clients that this is kind of like photocopying your rights because you keep them and then you give someone a copy of them, right? So they can't overrule you if you do not want something. They, they're not able to do it without your permission. You can take it away whenever you would like, but they are able to act on your behalf. Like the example I gave with my aunt and my mother. Healthcare surrogate is a document where you authorize another person to make healthcare decisions for you. And this can take effect either after you no longer have the ability to do that yourself or immediately. So you could sign a healthcare surrogate designation giving your son permission to make healthcare decisions for you even right now. Again, with this document, you still have the right to make medical decisions. So if your son has signed you up for a surgery and that's not what you want, you can say, no, that's not what I want. So it keeps that ability of allowing someone else to help you when you'd like or make decisions for you when you'd like, but then you can still overrule them and you can still say no or yes. Advanced directives are documents where you say what you want to happen when you're not able to say yourself. So for example, if I have a psychiatric disability, I may say, okay, um, I have schizophrenia and you know, I, I, I'm doing well, so I don't expect that to happen now, but if I'm ever hospitalized again, these are the medications that work for me. These are the ones that don't make me feel well. And this is the kind of treatment that I, I don't want so that doctors know what treatments are okay and not okay for me. Information releases are documents where I give someone else access to my information. So I may sign a HIPAA release giving my granddaughter access to my healthcare records and saying that my granddaughter can talk to my doctor, can call and ask for information, can disclose information. So even though I'm still going to make all those healthcare decisions myself, my granddaughter can assist me. She can come to the appointments with me, although she can come even if I don't have a HIPAA release, but she can get these records and help me look through my healthcare information. And the last is representative payee. So this is for people who receive social security benefits. It's a representative payee is a person who gets the benefits from social security and makes sure that all of your basic necessities are met. So paying for rent, food, and then the rest of the money they either give to you or save for you. And one thing with uh, social security is that if someone's only income is social security, then a representative payee is going to be more than sufficient and we, we don't need a guardianship. We don't need to take away their property rights if there's really no other significant income that they're receiving. So these are just tools that you should consider before a guardianship, could these work? Because the, could these offer the person the support that they need? I have a, a sort of complicated little chart here showing how supported decision-making could work and bear with me, I'll explain how it, how it breaks down. So I'm the decision maker in the middle, right? Say I'm an older adult, maybe I'm 80 years old and I'm getting that help that I told you where my um, niece is helping me to make my decisions with regards to finances. So I've signed a power of attorney, giving her access to my bank account. I've also signed a power of attorney so that she can help me rent out my house because I need that income for my new assisted living facility where I'm living. So I'm sharing my rights with her. That's why you see that dotted line arrow I didn't lose them, I'm sharing them. She has that green dot, I have that green check mark, we're both able to exercise my rights. And in return, she's giving me support. And then maybe on my left here, I have my granddaughter, who I told you guys, I'm giving her a HIPAA release so she can talk to my doctors and request my records, but I'm not giving her permission to actually make healthcare decisions for me. So I have that dotted line where I'm sharing information, but she has that red check, she has a red, X instead of a green check mark because she can't make decisions for me. And then she's giving me support. So it's just an example of ways that you can structure supported decision making using the tools that we talked about here so that people that you trust can give you support and can help you do the things that might be harder for you as you age.
So do we have questions at this stage? Everyone's being quiet so far, but feel free to type questions in the Q&A box as they come to you. Perfect. So I wanted to give you guys a, an example here, right? I decide with support. We have um, an older woman who is trying to use um, supported decision making. And again, maybe these are some of the areas where she's getting help, right? She's getting help with the finances, with that power of attorney we talked about. And maybe um, something new here is she's trying to decide where to live, right? Maybe um, it's hard to manage her house now. Maybe it's too big for her. Maybe she'd like to downsize or she'd like to consider an assisted living facility. And so she wants to use supported decision making with her granddaughter's help to maybe visit some assisted living facilities, see if she likes them. She might feel comfortable. Maybe she'll want to consider hiring a home health aide, someone who can come in and give her help at her own home. And so let's figure out if that's something that she can afford. And if we need any special authorizations to, for example, authorize her granddaughter to hire and fire people for her, maybe we'll do that in a power of attorney. So it's just another example of ways that we can use supported decision making to help older adults. Supported decision making in the United States. So SDM has really grown in the United States. The first case that we had was in, was it South Carolina? Now I'm not actually sure the state, so I will take that back. But it was a Jenny Hatch case, and I invite you guys to go online and learn about it. It was a person with a developmental disability. So it's certainly something that started with that community and has really grown because we've seen that other populations can benefit from it as well. So people with mental illnesses, people who have age-related disabilities. And here you see every state that has a star is a state where there is currently a supported decision-making law. So even without a supported decision-making law, you can probably use supported decision-making in every state in the United States, right? Because no one can keep you from getting advice from people who you trust. But these are states where there's actually a law. Oftentimes the laws require judges to consider supported decision-making before guardianship, which can be pretty powerful. And DC is one of the, the ones who has starred here. So it's 12 states right now and DC. We have a campaign in Florida where we are trying to get a supported decision-making law passed. If you wanna learn more about that, you can go to www.idecideflorida.org. And this is a campaign that we've been working on. We started to have conversations in the legislative session that just ended and we actually got the bill introduced and got a lot of stakeholders to the table. It's a bill that was developed by the disability community. So we have a coalition with a number of disability advocacy organizations, as well as people who have experienced um, guardianship firsthand, both parents and people with disabilities. So we would really love to continue to incorporate more stakeholders. And one community that we really would love to see more involved is older adults, because I think that this is something that will make a big difference for them. And the way the bill is written now, they will be able to take advantage of it. So if you are in one, in an organization that represents older adults, or you are an older adult, and you're interested, please contact me. So here's a sample supported decision making agreement. Supported decision making can be formalized in a supported decision making agreement, or it can just happen naturally. So for example, I use supported decision making in an informal way. Whenever I have to make big healthcare decisions, I call my parents and I ask them for advice. Um, whenever I have to take my car to the mechanic, I always get advice because I never understand what they are telling me. And I want to know if it's a good price, if it makes sense. So I use it informally, but some people benefit from writing it down. And this is an example of what that might look like. It's really important that the supported decision making agreement is tailored to the decision maker. So we want to make sure that it is written in a way that they can understand in a way that they prefer. So the basics of what should be in there is who are my supporters? What are they going to support me with? How are they going to support me? This example is pretty simple. We have others that incorporate powers of attorney. I also have supported decision making agreements that have pictures because my clients um, tend to be pretty visual. Then I also have did one where it was written. We also did a recording for my client because my client couldn't read. 
So really you wanna tailor it for each person. And I think it's important to note here, since I've talked about informal and formal use, the bill that we are trying to pass in Florida would be about formal supported decision-making agreements. And those would be specifically for people with disabilities. And by that, we mean people who have a disability as determined by the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we just copy pasted that same definition and put it into our bill. So that would certainly include older adults who have age-related disabilities, like for example, if they have arthritis or if they have um, diabetes or some other age-related disability, they would be a person with a disability, they can benefit from this law. So that's the one we're hoping to pass. Does anyone have a question at this stage? You've seen a sample supported decision-making agreement. You've heard about how it might work, about our legislative efforts. This is a good time to pause. Great information, but you're doing such a good job. No one has questions. You know, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so here's question number two. I get this one pretty often. Don't guardianships provide you with control over what happens to your loved one? I love my elderly father. I know him best and I want to protect him, right? So guardianships as a way to protect people. The answer here is that guardianships give the courts ultimate control over your loved one. So it is different from, I always tell parents who are considering this when their children are about to turn 18, that being a guardian is different from being a parent, right? Because when you are a parent, you get to make all the decisions for your children. Obviously there's limits, right? Um, but usually the court's not going to intervene unless there's abuse, neglect, or exploitation, for the most part. With guardianships, the court is the one who's in charge of this person who is now going to be under guardianship, and they are appointing the guardian to handle the day-to-day -day affairs for the court, right? And so they have to tell the court how they are doing that and make sure that they're informing the court that they're doing a good job, that the person is doing well. There's a couple ways that that happens. The you were doing to help the person regain capacity, that they've been to their doctor, things like that. A judge decides who's guardian. I always tell people to make sure that they would be qualified to be a guardian before they apply. You wanna make sure that there isn't some sort of criminal legal history, or other issues that might be a red flag for the court and could disqualify you. So you wanna check that before you request guardianship because if the person is found incapacitated, then the court may appoint a stranger. And so you wanna obviously make sure that you're considering all other alternatives and that there isn't something else that would work better. So the court must approve moving your loved one if they've lost the right to travel and if they're moving outside of the county. So sometimes we parents don't realize that, for example, if their young adult is participating in Special Olympics and needs to travel, they're gonna have to ask for permission every time that happens. Or you know, if you wanna take them to Disney World and you live in Miami-Dade County, you will have to do that. For older adults, I think this is also applicable, right? You may wanna take grandma on a nice trip to visit family members upstate, and you're gonna have to ask the court for permission to do that. So for people who are commuting, pretty often between counties, it's something to consider and you can structure probably the guardianship in a way to avoid that. But these are important things to note, right? The court is the person who is in charge. It's not you, it's the court. The court decides who the guardian is, the court makes sure that you're doing a good job. So there, there is that oversight and it's important because guardians have a lot of power, right? Remember we, we reviewed all of those rights that you can lose guardians have a lot of power. So we do need to make sure that they're doing their job correctly. I mean, this oversight is really, really important. I just want you to consider, did we even need the guardianship? Because if we didn't, then this oversight is, is kind of a lot. If we do need the guardianship, then it's very important that, that this is in place. Question number three, I want my grandparent to stay as independent as possible. How do you recommend I approach guardianship? So I always recommend going from less restrictive to most restrictive. And we have this inverted pyramid here. So for you, those of you who are not able to see, we have an inverted pyramid. At the top, we have supported decision-making, followed by information releases, followed by powers of attorney, followed by advanced directives, 
followed by healthcare surrogate, followed by representative payee, followed by guardian advocacy and guardianship. And then we have these arrows that show that as we move down, the person has less rights. And as you move up, they have more rights. So under supported decision-making, I'd have all my rights. Under guardianship or guardian advocacy, I could lose all of my rights. Then at the very top, we have persons making their own decisions, right? I'm making my own decisions in SDM. In my information releases, I'm making my own decisions. Then we start to go into a little bit more restrictive, right? These are, they're changeable. The person's directing them and they're limited, but I'm giving away some power with the powers of attorney, the advanced directives, the healthcare surrogate. I'm letting other people make some decisions for me. Representative pay there as well, right? Someone else is managing my money for me. And then at the very bottom with guardian advocacy and guardianship, we have permanent and total because even though you can request to get someone out of a guardianship, the reality is that most people who go into guardianship will die under guardianship. It tends to be pretty permanent and total. It's pretty hard to get out of a guardianship. It's pretty expensive to get out of a guardianship. So we want to go from less restrictive to most restrictive and try it out. Doesn't work? Okay, moving on to the next thing. Didn't work? Moving on to the next thing. And then at the last, at the very bottom, we'll try guardianship and guardian advocacy. And I realized that I haven't been giving you guys a description of each of our, my slides, but most of the ones before were just content. And then I think I did describe some of the pictures for you. So I apologize about that. The dignity of risk. So this one, I will definitely describe the picture because it is a funny one. So we have the words dignity of risk, and then we have a person who's sitting in a wheelchair and is just completely enveloped in pillows and wearing a helmet. And then we have someone else who's pushing the wheelchair. So this is the idea that in order, sometimes we're so concerned with protecting someone from absolutely everything that could go wrong, that we keep them from the dignity of taking risks, making mistakes, learning from those mistakes. And this is really important for older adults because even though they are older, they still um, should be able to enjoy their lives and direct them and do things that are valuable and important to them. So I have a picture here that says quality of life. And I have some photos from a series by a photographer, Kendrick Brinson, which you can find on her website, kendrickbrinson.com. And she did a series of an older retirement home in, I think it was in Arizona, where the older adults are super active. So I have a picture of elderly cheerleaders who are actually standing one on top of the other doing some pretty um, impressive gymnastics. And you could see there that there is risk there, right? Like these older women could fall <laughs> and hurt themselves and break their backs and they're older and that could be pretty significant, right? But engaging in this activity, being cheerleaders, it's important to them. It makes them happy. It makes their life have meaning and value. And so we should respect their right to take that risk, right? To have the dignity of risk. I have another picture of an older adult who's about to jump into a pool at the beginning of a, a swimming competition. And that's from the same series. So, you know, that could also be dangerous, right? The older person could drown. Um, you know, they could, they could fall wrong and, and, and hurt themselves. There's a lot of things that could happen. But to this older adult, taking that risk is important and it adds to their quality of life. So it's something I think we need to keep in mind. I like one example that I read online of an older man who lived in a nursing home facility and loved walking over to buy some ice cream every day. Yeah, he could fall or he could get lost, I guess, theoretically, but but it was important to him. And so how are there ways that we can allow him to do this every day, right? Maybe right now he's fine, but maybe he develops dementia and he gets lost and maybe someone will accompany him to walk over to buy his ice cream cone. There are ways that we should figure out how to help people take reasonable risks, engage in the activities that make them feel good, that make them feel like who they are while supporting them and finding ways to do that. So this is a good place to stop also for questions. Maybe put in the chat comments if you are really excited about this photo series and are gonna go look it up online. I love the photo series and, and I am not that flexible or coordinated. So I'm very impressed. And I, I didn't even notice they were older adults at first. So very impressive, but everyone is still quiet in the chat. Okay, well, I will keep going. 
So how can Disability Rights Florida help? We help people with disabilities. And again, it does not matter the age. So supported decision-making is one of the ways that we help. We help people draft those agreements and other documents that they might need. Again, even without a supported decision-making law in Florida, we can still use SDM. And in fact, many people in Florida are. I have tons of clients who are using SDM. We can help with terminating a guardianship in favor of supported decision-making. And we can do consultations about SDM guardianship and figuring out just what works for you and your family. All our services are free and confidential. We also help with all kinds of things that you could think of that are legal issues related to a person's disability. So if you're facing discrimination at home, at work or at school, abuse or neglect at nursing homes, we as the Protection and Advocacy Agency for the state of Florida have access to these facilities and can go and investigate any claims. The Protection and Advocacy Agency, what that means is that we get money from the federal government to represent people with disabilities in Florida and to protect their rights. So we also, with that comes power to access certain places like nursing home facilities. We can also help with access to assistive technology and so much more. So the best way to figure out if we can help you is to call us. I will provide here the phone number. If you're interested in SDM, please go ahead and call me. You can use the contact information in the orange box. That's my office phone and my cell phone. Now that we are remote because of COVID, Basically all my calls go to my cell phone. So feel free to just use that one. And then if you are interested in something other than SDM and you'd like to call Disability Rights Florida, you can use the information in the red box. So the number is 800-342-0823. And then the website is disabilityrightsflorida.org. And then my email is vivianabl at disabilityrightsflorida.org. My cell phone is 954 954- 483-5918. And if you did not catch that because I said it too quickly, just go ahead and put it in the chat and I will repeat it. Thank you for such a clear and concise overview of this. It's really exciting to learn about it. Uh, thank you to the closed captioners for keeping up with us all day. I know we as attorneys talk too much and too quickly, so I just want to give a shout out to our closed captioners on all the sessions. We did have a couple questions come through. So the first one is from Sarah Halsell. She said, if I'm understanding correctly, supported decision making is an overall concept that can include formal mechanisms like a power of attorney, as well as informal mechanisms. Um, is it a, is SDM accomplished through a formal agreement, um, and is it how is it different than a power of attorney? So it's up to each person. Supported decision making is the idea that when I need support, I turn to the people who I trust, and they give me advice. So if you've ever gotten advice from someone, you have used supported decision making. Of course, what we're focusing on here is when we want to do that in a more formal way. So supported decision-making can be formalized in an agreement. Right now in Florida, we don't have a supported decision-making law. So that agreement that you make is going to be an agreement between you and someone that you trust where you're going to write out, how they're going to help you, in what ways. And, and that agreement is, is not necessarily something that you can take to the doctor. I mean, I encourage you, if you have a doctor who you can trust, so that they can see how you're going to work with the person who's going to give you advice, but it's not something that's going to require the doctor to do anything, right? It's not legally going to require the doctor to do anything. So knowing that, we might incorporate other tools that would give our supporters whatever authority we would like for them to have. So if I want them to actually act on my behalf, I might sign a power of attorney. So that's how they're different, right? Powers of attorney actually give people permission to act on my behalf. And actually, in the bill, that we're currently proposing, you would still need a power of attorney to have someone act on your behalf. You would only be able to authorize certain things under a supported decision-making agreement. So um, access to information and then having someone help you communicate your decisions is what you would be able to authorize under the bill. But so you might incorporate a power of attorney if you want your supporter to act on your behalf. Like the example I gave of my mom who helps my aunt with renting her house and with her bank account. So that's that's how they would come in and work together. I hope that answers your question, but go ahead and do a follow-up if I didn't. 
That makes sense. Um, as a follow up, are you able to share the model law that you proposed? Yeah, for sure. So you could actually go online and go to our website, www.idecideflorida.org. And we have a link to the bills that were proposed in the 2021 legislative session. And we are working on those now to get them reintroduced next session. So if you see them and you have ideas of ways to make them better, go ahead and contact us. We're happy to hear from everyone. It's really important for us that this bill reflects the community. So if you're a stakeholder and you're someone who this would affect, we would love to hear from you. It's really important to us. I put that website in the chat for everyone. And we did awesome. have another question. The difficulty is when the older person does not agree that help is needed and really don't have the capacity to sign agreements, but the family cannot afford guardianship. Do you have any advice on that situation? Yeah, I mean, under Florida law, right, with the tools currently available under Florida law, even after we pass the supported decision making law, there might still be people for whom there's nothing else that's going to work except guardianship, right? And uh, you know, internationally, we've been moving away from things like guardianship, right? Article 12 of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities talks about taking away decision-making capacity for people. But the reality is that in Florida right now, with the tools available, there's going to be people who, even though we tried everything else, the only thing that's going to work for them that's available is guardianship. And so that's that's okay. If that is what happens, that's that's what happened. You tried other alternatives. So what you're describing could be a case where, where that's true, where maybe the person needs assistance, but they're not able to vocalize, I want help, and this is who I want to help me. I think it's important to, to note that for a power of attorney, for healthcare surrogate designation, the standard of what the person needs to understand is fairly low, right? For a healthcare surrogate designation, I need to be able to say, I want my mom to make healthcare decisions for me. I want my granddaughter to make healthcare decisions for me. And maybe you could practice some examples. If I need a surgery, do you want mom to decide? Yeah. So if they're able to do that, then they understand the nature and effect of that document. They understand if I sign this, I'm giving mom permission or I'm giving my granddaughter permission, then I think they have the capacity required to sign that document. And I would say the same about a power of attorney. If someone can say, I want my granddaughter to handle my finances. I want her to take care of the money. money. And when I sign this, that means my granddaughter is taking care of the money. They have the capacity to sign that document. I don't think they need to be able to explain what a power of attorney is and cite the legal statute. Um, it's, it's, it's a fairly low bar. So if they're able to do that, then we might be able to use that instead of a guardianship. And then that preserves their ability to say, no, I don't want that if something is happening that's not to their liking. And that, that's important. Okay. Um, on a related note, if, if the guardianship is needed, do you know of any, any resources or does the family basically have to be able to afford plenary guardianship? Right, so now we're talking about the, the funding. So yeah, I mean, it is really expensive. There are organizations, legal aid organizations that will take cases for low-income families. So for example, in Miami-Dade, Dave Legal Aid does them for free. I think FIU Embrace used to do them for free. I think now they're doing them low bono, but um, you should ask them. So there are organizations, but they do have long waiting lists. I mean, that's, that's just the truth. Um, but there are organizations that could help you, but it varies county by county. I'm only familiar with, with the help available in Miami-Dade. The guardian advocacy process was created in part to address that issue because you can bring it yourself without needing an attorney. So that could be an option as well if finances are an issue. But again, I mean, it will depend on what's appropriate for the person and what they qualify for. Um, since Florida doesn't have an SDM law, have there been any instances where a court has dissolved a guardianship in favor of supported decision-making? Love this question. Yes. <laughs> It's happened three times. So at least that we are aware of. So the first was Michael Lincoln McCrate. That case was in St. Lucie County. And Michael is actually the co-chair of the SDM for Florida Coalition. So he helped draft the bill and is leading that charge. So it's one of the ways in which we're saying this is really coming from the community. 
The other case was Tyler Borges' case in Miami Dade County. You can look him, actually, you can look up both Tyler and Michael up online. There's a lot of coverage about them. But Tyler was on the front page of the Miami Herald twice, first when he filed and then when he got his rights back. And we won his case in part by showing that using supported decision making, he was able to make his own decisions. Then we had another case recently where the, the judge said the same thing. We were able to show with supported decision making, they're able to make their own decisions, therefore they have capacity. And the court agreed and actually included in the order, you know, they use supported decision making. It's also in the order for Michael Lincoln's case. So it's pretty exciting. I think judges are starting to understand both the difference between needing help and being um, incapacitated, and then also how SDM can help someone who's quote unquote incapacitated. So I'll take a second because there aren't that many questions to go into that distinction. But basically for Michael's case, the judge found when they, the, so Michael was the person who was under guardianship, right? And he goes to the judge and says, listen, I think I can exercise my own rights. I want you to give me my rights back. And the judge appointed a doctor to evaluate him as is required by law. And that doctor found, well, Mike has capacity for all of his rights, except three of them. I think one of them was property, maybe medical, and, and there was another one. And so the the attorney who is representing Michael argued, okay, judge, maybe he doesn't have capacity for those three rights, um, you know, on his own, but supported decision making is a less restrictive alternative. It's a better way for him to exercise those rights than if you give them to a guardian. And so judge, you should consider giving him back those rights so he can exercise them using supported decision making agreement. So with the help of people that he trusts. And the judge was like, great, great idea, and did that. So even though he was found incapacitated for those three rights, they were given back to him and restored so he could make his own decisions using SDM. And he also had a power of attorney. I think he had a representative face. So there, there were a couple of tools that were combined there. And then there's the other way, right, where you are explaining to the judge, just because I need help doesn't mean I can't do it. And you're explaining you know, maybe on my own, math is difficult for me, so I can't balance my checkbook alone. But if my mom sits down with me and helps me and we pull out a calculator, I can do it. And I have an app on my phone and I check my bank account every time I make a purchase to make sure that I have enough. So with supported decision-making, I can do it. I have capacity. And that's another way that we've used supported decision-making to get people's rights back. So that's, it's something that I see pretty often is evaluations where the evaluators will look at someone like that and say, oh, well, they need help, so they, they don't have capacity. And that's wrong. A lot of us get help to make our decisions. I mean, a lot of people hire financial advisors who manage their money entirely. Why shouldn't people with disabilities be able to do the same? That's pretty exciting. We have another great question. Um, Anne says, I love the concept of the dignity of risk, but how do you counterbalance this with health providers or institutions' fears of liability and tort lawyers if they don't do all they can to prevent falls or other injuries? Right. I mean, I think this is a, it's a difficult question, and I think it's one that you have to have with the older adult, with their family members, and of course, you know, we're talking about reasonable risks, right? If, if you're pretty sure the person can't walk, don't let them go get an ice cream cone on their own if they, they really can't. Um, but if they can, right, if someone is able to walk, they have their cane, they move around, you don't need to confine them to the bed just so you don't get sued. So I think, you know, it's, it's being thoughtful and reasonable. And certainly we're not advocating for just, um, you know, like washing your hands and saying, well, not my problem if something happens. I mean, if you are there to care for the person, you do, you do have a responsibility to them. So it's a process. I think involving the person and their family, you know, the people who could sue you in the conversation and talking about what is important to them, what do we think are appropriate risks, I think is good. And, and as lawyers, there are probably ways that we can be creative about limiting that liability. Is there something that they can sign? Um, is there some sort of waiver that they could sign saying, I'm going to go get my ice cream cone? You know, I'm not sure that's not my area of practice, but I think we can be creative to both um, honor our legal requirements, liabilities, and then what the person is, what is important to that person. 
I don't see any other questions. So thank you again for all that information, Viviana. It was a, a great presentation and I hope you can come back and do some future trainings for us. Um, I did want to remind everyone that we have one more session to close out the day beginning at four o'clock. So I hope everyone can join us for that. But thank you again to Viviana. I hope your EJW project goes really well. And thank you so much for sharing this information with us. All thank right, you I'm gonna so go, much. I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and then come back at four o'clock. So you got a little time for a coffee break. See everyone at four.